When that blessed sacrament came in, I just read this, and it, it's, got, it's blown me away. She got a new book. I'm always reading. Well, I'm not smart. I just like to read. It's called The Real Presence Down Through the Age. Oh, it's great. It's really it's a beautiful book. So when the blessed sacrament comes in, and he's up here, do you really? Do you realize that today and tomorrow, when the priest or the Eucharistic ministers hold up the Eucharist and you look at him before you consume the host, do you realize that you are in communion with the saints? Do you know that at this moment, the saints are looking upon the beatific vision of God in heaven and you, this moment, are looking at God here on earth? Do you realize that? So if you look at it on one end of the spectrum, on our end, we're looking at the host, Jesus and the host. And if you cross the screen into God's kingdom, into heaven, the saints are looking at that same host, only they're looking at the beatific vision of Jesus. So while they are adoring our Lord Jesus in the beatific vision, we are adoring our Lord Jesus in the blessed sacrament. What a powerful gift that is. We, we have been given that gift. We have a lot of power. We are the majority. Did you know that? Did you know Did that? You know that? We are the majority. Did you know that? We are not the minority. Don't we are the anybody, majority. Don't let anybody con you into it. See, we have allowed our brains to become mush. We are the majority, but we are the uh, silent majority, and that can't be. I don't anymore. think this group's a. We silent cannot majority. be a silent majority. We've got to be a vocal majority because down through the centuries, again, those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. Vocal minorities with self-interest have always taken over the world and the church. We can go back to the very beginning. You can go back to Martin Luther's time. These were not in the majority. These were small groups of people with big mouths. And who had self-interest? Do you know that Martin Luther never left the church? Did you know that? Did you know that those people did not know they were no longer Catholic? Did you know that? Is that going to happen to us? We no have way. the Scandinavian countries. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Scandinavian countries, but they are probably the most godless of the countries that we can think of. They were the strongest Catholic country. Strong Did Catholic country. Did you hear country. that? They never ever wanted to leave the church. They never wanted to become Lutheran. A small vocal minority were able to turn them around and make them Lutherans. Now they're not even Lutherans. They've lost that. They've given up on that too. When, when we were in uh, Cleveland, we were backstage and they were waiting to serve us. And uh, there were these wonderful young people, and they were not being smart alecks. You know, don't always judge our teenagers, and don't read all this garbage in the media, because we've got wonderful young people. And so one of the young boys turned to me, and he was not being wise. Please believe me, he was sincere. He said, are you a priest? And I said, hey, that's impossible. Number one, I'm a woman. Number two, I'm married. And number three, I'm Catholic. Three strikes, I'm out. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, most of the Catholics want a priest, don't they? To women, be women priests and married priests, don't they? And at that moment, at that moment, a priest had just finished saying something. We're backstage, and you heard the roar. I mean the roar of Christians, not of lions, but of Christians. And I said, son, there's the majority. You have just heard the majority speak. We must roar like lions, and the lions must become lambs. We must make ourselves heard. We must do that. And how do we do that? You say, oh, wow, you know, how am I going to do it? We have weapons. We have tremendous weapons. One of the greatest weapons we have ever been given is the rosary. The rosary, the gift that our lady has given us. The rosary. And what is the rosary? Where do we gather strength from the rosary? How do we gather strength from the rosary? We go back with Mary. We follow Mary as she takes us hand by hand through the life of Jesus. That's the rosary. That's the power of the rosary. We have a little girl, 
and our ministry, she's married, she's 26, and she's a convert, we call her little because uh, a year and a half, a Catholic. And she's very powerful, power, very powerful. These young Baptist people. converts, those are the most uh, powerful Catholics you've ever heard of me. And, <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. And we were uh, doing the editing on our rosary documentary for Mother Angelica at our own studio, and she came in and I heard, she was sniffing and I looked around at her and she was crying. Tears coming down. And she said, that's the best documentary you've ever done. I looked at her and she said, I never knew that Any the rosary was the life of Jesus and Mary. She never knew anything about the rosary. She never taught anything about the rosary in RCIA. Well, it's, it's understandable. You've got a lot of stuff to teach them, but there's so many things they have to know. And so she said, oh, if I had that in a book, I could let my mother, who's a Baptist, and my grandmother, who's a Baptist, read that. They would love that because it is scriptural. And I said, of course it's scriptural. The rosary is the life of Jesus and Mary. And so with her and then people calling up and write a book, we had been writing this over the last couple of years, but we just put it together. And what we discovered as we were putting it together was, it shocked us. You know when you pray the, the, the uh, joyful mysteries? It's supposed to be joyful, huh? There's a lot of stuff in there that's not so joyful. Think about it. The slaughter of the innocents. Mary at the presentation. Mary at the Annunciation. Joyful, your son will be the cause of the ruin of Israel, of many, so that hearts will be laid bare. Mary knew Holy Scripture. She knew what would happen to her son. And she said, yes. We really believe that the walk to the way of the cross began at the Annunciation. Our Lady began walking the way of the cross and we believe that the seven sorrows, we call them the seven sorrows, were many more than seven. We believe they call it seven because seven is that perfect number. We believe that infinite. maybe the first sorrow began right there at the Annunciation when she knew, because she knew scripture. And she knew that the Messiah was gonna have to die the way he died. At the presentation, sure her heart jumped with joy when they recognized her son, but then, she knew what he was talking about. She knew scripture, she knew again. Oh, he's reminding me, he's reminding me that my son will suffer. When the baby is born, when the angels come and adore the baby. You don't think about, you know, you know, you know, but you know, you know in your head, but in your heart you say, well, maybe, just maybe, we're gonna be able to skip by this because you start living the life and you forget, you know that this child was born to die. I mean, that's the reason Jesus was born was to die for us. But as you're going along and, and, and you're into the, the seventh or eighth year or the tenth year and nothing has happened, so you go to the temple. When he's 12 years old, you go into the temple as you did every year. And when you get there and you spend three days and you come back, the first day on the road when Joseph and Mary met at the end of the day, they found that Jesus was not with them, either one of them. One thought he was with one, one thought he was with the other. They went charging back into Jerusalem and they didn't run to the temple. That was not the first place they looked. That was probably the last place they looked. They probably looked where they had stayed at the inn, friends that they had been with. They probably went all over Jerusalem and as a last ditch effort, we can't find him anywhere. Let's go look in the temple. And do you, have you ever had your child late? Have you ever thought that your child was lost? Many parents today do not know where their children are. Well, I think that Joseph and Mary suffered the worst pain those three days looking for that boy. <laughs> and then, you're, you know how we are when the kid, we find the when kid. When you find him, are you okay? I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> how could you do this? Your father and I were so worried. But that wasn't the end of her pain. Was her pain not when he said, 
Did you not know I had to be about my father's work? What did that mean? Reality check. All of a sudden, wow, you are just shot right into why this is all happening. It's all brought right back to you. He looked at her, and in those eyes, he probably said, if anybody, if anybody knows why I should be here, it's you. You know, you know what this is all about. And what might she have said in her eyes to him? It's all right, son. See, Mary had to say yes over and over and over and over again when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he sweat blood. Yes, I believe it was for the sins that had been committed and those that were to be committed. But you know what else I think? Because Jesus was a perfect son. I think it was for the sorrow that his mother would have to suffer. I think his heart was breaking because his mother had to suffer. The wedding feast of Cana, a joyful occasion. Jesus gave honor to the sacrament of marriage. Praise Jesus, he gave us honor. He lifted our sacrament up high. And yet when his mother came to him and said, they're out of wine, I mean, what is the big deal? They're out of wine. This is none of our business. And when he said to her, woman, what business is this of yours or mine? We have to understand what he was saying. If I do this, what you're proposing, it's going to hasten the walk to Calvary. Do you want me to start today, Mom? Mom? Can't I have one more night? Can we have a little more time, Mom? Do you want me to start the way of the cross? The and way to my death now, Mom? And she understood it. And she said, yes, son. Do you realize that? Do you realize and how dare anybody speak against my mother, your mother, who said to her precious son, yes, son, for us, that we might have life eternal. She knew. That was the only way. Let's put ourselves in Mary's shoes for a minute. It's the uh, time of the betrayal in the garden. Judas comes with the soldiers. She's there. She was there. I would have to think that Mary spent a lot of time with Judas. Because don't we always spend the most time with the weakest of our children? The troubled the child, one, the don't troubled we? One. Don't we spend a lot of time with them? We're trying to bring them around, trying to get them back together. I think she spent a lot of time with Judas. And she saw Judas kiss her son and betray him with a kiss. How do you think she felt when Judas did that after she had spent all this time trying to bring him around? How do you think Mary felt when these people are all there and Pilate turns to them and says, who do you choose? And I don't think it started immediately with everyone roaring, we choose Barabbas. I don't think so. It was that vocal minority. Well placed, intimidating. Vocal minority with self-interest. Intimidating, intimidating, frightening. And they all piped in. Doesn't it wound you? It has always wounded me. When we have to cry out, Barabbas, we choose Barabbas. Do Doesn't like it that? kill you? When we have to do this on Good Friday and on, on Palm Sunday, we're the ones who have to yell out, we want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. And what should I do with your Jesus, the King of the Jews? And what do you what answer? Do say? What do we have to say? Crucify him. Crucify him, that's what we said. That's our part. Are we not crucifying him? Are we not choosing Barabbas when we allow false teaching in this church? Are we not choosing Barabbas? Are we not intimidated? Are we not standing by when Jesus is being crucified, spit upon? God. How do you think she felt? How do you think, do you think she feels when we do this? 
How do you think she feels when we, she puts a lot into us. And how do you think she feels when we allow these things to happen and do nothing about them? Who is Mary? Mary is our mother who stood beneath the cross. And she stood there silently. Oh, I believe she was screaming inside. I believe she was screaming to high heaven inside, but she would not cause her son any pain. They met on the way of the cross, on the Via Della Rosa. They met. I have to believe, and this is only my belief, this is not church teaching, that this relationship was so strong that if she had weakened, if, if she, when he looked at her, you know, all you think about is she looking at him and seeing her son who was so destroyed. Beaten. But what about Bloody. when he looked at her and saw how destroyed she was, watching all that had happened, being completely helpless to do anything. If she would have thought to herself, if I tell him to stop, mm. maybe it'll stop. If I tell him, don't do it, maybe the crucifixion will never happen. But she said to him, it's okay, son. It's okay to die. One time I was on pilgrimage with this wonderful Monsignor, who was twice my size, which is not a big deal. But when he's a Sicilian who's twice your size, that's something. And he said, uh, Penny, do you know why your son had to die? And I didn't look at him. I said, no. And he said, so that you could do this work. And I said to him, then tell Jesus to take back all this work and give me my son. Mary never said that. Mary said yes to the very end. And there are times that we've got a problem, especially when you go to Rome and you look at the, magnif at the uh, Pieta in St. Peter's Basilica, and you look at this very resigned, peaceful, calm face of this lady when her son, her dead, mutilated son's body is, is put in front of her. How could this be? How could she not react that way? There is a, uh, there's another Pieta in the Holy Land, and it shows Our Lady screaming, screaming. And we went to the Passion Play in Oberammergau in 1983, and it's in German, but they give you books so you, and you can understand, you know, we know the story. And at that point, when her son was being crucified, when they were ripping the clothes off him, and they were nailing the nails into his fingers, into his hands and his feet. She was yelling, not him, do it to me, not to him. And isn't that what we mothers, we imperfect mothers would be saying? Don't hurt my baby, do it to me. You think Mary didn't cry out in her heart, do it to me? Edith Stein, a martyr, blessed Edith Stein, a martyr of Auschwitz, a martyr of Nazism, came to Jesus through the cross and that other Jewish convert, she said, Mother Mary. I would just like to read you something that she wrote. Today, I stood with you beneath the cross and felt more clearly than I ever did that you became our mother only there. Even an earthly mother faithfully seeks to fulfill the last will of her son, but you became the handmaid of the Lord. The life and being of God and of man was perfectly inscribed in your own life, so you could take your own into your heart. And with the lifeblood of your bitter pains, you purchase life anew for every soul. You know us all, our wounds, our imperfections, but you know also the celestial radiance which your son's love would shed on us in heaven. Thus carefully, you guide our faltering footsteps, no price too high, 
for you to lead us to our goal. And this is what she lived by, by those whom you have chosen for companions to stand with round the eternal throne. They here must stand with you beneath the cross and with the lifeblood of their bitter pains must purchase heavenly glory for those souls whom God's own son entrusted to their care. We really